This is KGW News at 11. We begin with a celebration of life tonight for a woman gone too soon. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Galen Etlin. Portland State University hosted that vigil for a student who was shot and killed early Monday morning. Our Art Edwards joins us live in southwest Portland now and talk about a powerful day, Art. Well, it certainly was. You know, the celebration of life was held here at the Smith Memorial Student Union on the campus at Portland State University. It was a chance for people to gather to remember Amara Marluk. We come together to mourn, to learn, reflect, as well as to celebrate the many wonderful ideas, actions, commitments, and energy that this young student had at Portland State. Hundreds of people filled the ballroom inside the Smith Memorial Student Union to celebrate the life of Amara Marluk. The 19-year-old music major was shot and killed early Monday morning. Amara was a bright, uh, kind girl. I wish I would have had more of an opportunity to get to know her, and I know that um, she would have been an amazing addition to all of the efforts we have here on campus to advocate for students and involve students. She was celebrated as a shining star on campus. News of her death spread beyond the university. She worked with Tualatin Hills Park and Recreation District on the Talking Walls mural project. The district said in a statement, Amara will forever be a part of our THPRD family. Amara was an incredible young woman an inspiring community activist, and a treasured friend to many of us at THPRD. Police charged Keenan Harpool with her murder. The 20-year-old freshman is a former PSU football player. He pled not guilty in his court appearance on Tuesday. Marluk's death has rocked the Portland State community. The hope is that the celebration of life can ease some of the pain. I think that it's easy to feel so separated as students and to be able to come together and to celebrate her and to be um, a part of that celebration makes us feel more like a community. The president of the university talked about the talk, talked about the tragic loss and said that the university is doing everything it can to make sure that everyone feels safe and welcome here on campus. Galen? Mm, a tragic story. Art, thank you so much for sharing with us. Well, two years after wildfires destroyed thousands of homes in Oregon, a group is still working to help survivors. Volunteers from Associated General Contractors meet twice a week to build sheds for people whose homes were destroyed in the Beachy Creek Fire. The group started this process last year and said it's meaningful to meet the people going through this, going through all of this. And Dinah McGuire is one of them. She and her family escaped the fire with the clothes on their back, a few papers and their car. But their home was destroyed. She now lives in a trailer on her property while their new home is under construction and the shed helps store belongings in the meantime. It's a godsend. I don't know what I would have done without it. It instills hope. It's encouragement. The Associated General Contractors volunteers have built 70 sheds so far and hope to reach 80 by the end of May. If you'd like to help, we've got info linked on KGW.com. All right, let's bring in meteorologist Joe Ranieri now. I know drought was a big factor when we were talking about wildfires mm -hmm. before, but we're now at least this week seeing quite a bit of moisture coming in. Yeah, and we're seeing things improve throughout the northwest side of the state, but still there's a lot of locations across the state, Galen, mm -hmm. and throughout parts of the Pacific Northwest that are either in extreme or really excessive drought. And then we're going to be starting to head into the warmer months where it's not going to improve anytime soon. But True. things are going to be looking really nice for the snowpack. That's one uh, bright spot we have, and it's going to be basically piling up between tonight and the end of next week. They could be looking at three and a half, maybe close to four feet of snow just on Mount Hood. I'm expecting to see more than that through parts of the central and southern Oregon Cascade. So the, the spring uh, rain has been great the last couple of weeks and the spring snow has been even better. As we go to the radar, we're starting to see some dry pockets along the northern Oregon coast, but also picking up some heavier cells over downtown Portland. You travel over the mountain passes, you are going to be seeing heavy snow the entire night and a good part of tomorrow as well. You've already seen seen 10 inches of new snow. I'm forecasting another 10 overnight and there could be close to a foot possible by the end of tomorrow. So it's just been incredible to see some of these snowfall amounts over the last couple of weeks. As we look at the future cast, we're also going to be seeing some cold air in place in the next couple of days where we're going to be looking at the potential of some low valley snow. Now there's a quite 
a chance to see a mix of rain and snow early Monday morning. I'll show you that in a second, but as we go into tomorrow morning after midnight, we'll start to see some drier conditions and most of us are going to be starting off tomorrow more dry than wet, but heading into the afternoon, the showers will pick up. You travel over the mountain passes. The snow levels could be at a thousand feet. That includes the coast range. So there could be a decent amount of snow, not just tonight, but into tomorrow night as well. By early Monday morning, we'll start to see transition from rain to mix of rain and snow to basically all snow heading into tomorrow or I should say uh, late Sunday night and into uh, early Monday morning. Rainfall amounts are going to be very impressive. This model is showing more than an inch of rain between tonight and the early part of next week. So I'm tracking April showers as well as April snow showers. I'll talk more about just how long this cold air is going to be in place and talk more about some of the watches and warnings that are in place the next couple of days too. Action packed, Joe. Thank you. We'll see you soon. We want to update you now on what's going on in Ukraine. At least 52 people are dead from a train station attack in the eastern city of Krematorsk. Ukraine is blaming Russia for that attack, but Moscow denies responsibility. Today, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson visited Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky in Kyiv. The UK even announced it would send more than $130 million in military aid, including 800 anti-tank missiles. As thousands continued to flee their homeland, Zelensky praised his country's courage, saying it has united the globe. But I would like Ukrainian cars to be shared by everyone in the world, just as we are defending ourselves against the greatest tyranny of all. So the other people of the world should bravely resist this tyranny. Outside Kyiv, forensic investigators are starting to exhume bodies from a mass grave to identify them. It's just one of the possible 112 war crimes committed by Russia so far. Meanwhile, Ukrainian officials warn Russian troops are regrouping after fleeing Kyiv and are preparing a full-scale attack in the eastern part of the country. And U.S. intelligence believes Russia may use U.S. support for Ukraine to interfere again in American politics. The Associated Press reports intelligence agencies have not found evidence. Russian President Vladimir Putin has authorized measures like those taken in 2016 and 2020. But officials believe he sees the U.S. backing Ukraine as directly targeting him. They think Putin may try responding with more Russian interference. Back locally now, the top judge in Oregon is asking for a new plan to improve the state's public defense and safety systems. Oregon has known for years there are not enough public defenders in the state. And that shortage is leading to more people being let out of jail after they commit a crime because the state cannot hold them without appointing a public defender. In a letter to Governor Kate Brown released yesterday, State Chief Justice Martha Wall Martha Walters, excuse me, called the situation an immediate crisis. She said Oregon cannot wait for a deliberative process to find a long-term solution. So starting next week, Walters plans to host a series of summits to address this situation. The focus will be on Multnomah County, where crime rates have increased the past two years. Well, you're going to start to see some changes around Willamette Falls in Oregon City. A new demolition phase is moving ahead at the old Blue Heron paper mill. The Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde bought that mill more than two years ago. The site has ties to many indigenous people. And phase two of demolition began last week. And four structures will be removed over the next two months. The idea is to make the area look like it did before the mill's construction and be a place for all to enjoy. It's exciting. Um, because it, the, the, while the public space is going to get the access there to, to share it with the, you know, the world. And a lot of times we think just the tribes and the Oregon community, but, but really this is a place that should be shared with the world. And, and that's really kind of how we see it. So besides taking down the old paper mill, the area will also be rebuilt with shops, dining areas, and lodging.